yes. Such a profound meaning in such a small word. It's a word that can change the course of the future. Our church, Mission City Church, is built on seeds of yes, planted by those who came before us. The faithful yes of one person can change everything. Imagine what God could do if each one of us simply said yes. I just want to say that as a church, we are, we are definitely entering into uh, a new season. And really, this is a season that, that literally could change the trajectory of our church, but I believe could change the trajectory of your life. That God wants to do something new in and through you. That God wants to, to strengthen our commitment and our surrender and our faith. As you think about our church and Mission City Church over the, the last really few years, seven to eight years, what God has done has been amazing. And over the last 18 months, more significantly what God has done has even been more amazing. We have almost 4,000 people right now between our locations that call Mission City Church home and worship with us uh, regularly. We've experienced numerical growth, but more importantly, we've experienced uh, transformation in life, spiritual growth. Even here last week, uh, we baptized over 30 people that said yes to Jesus Christ. And many of you were here and got to celebrate with us in that. And, and so what we want to look at is, as we look at the life of Abraham, which is really what we're going to do over the next six weeks, is we want... Uh, to talk about where we're going as a church and where God wants to take each one of us as individuals as we grow in our faith journey. It's part of our mission statement that we want to lead people in lives of transformation. So our team's been passing out this little booklet. A couple of things I want you to know about this booklet. Number one, again, I want everybody to receive one. Uh, but the first part of this booklet is what we're calling our vision pages. So everything you just saw on the video, plus some additional information and details that you can just kind of look through. Don't necessarily do it during my sermon, do it afterwards. Uh, but you can look through and see what all we're talking about in the days ahead, the vision. Uh, and then the second part of the book is message notes. Uh, most Sundays we have the message notes available outside on a little table as you walk in. But for the next six weeks, they're part of your book in your guide, which means we want you to bring this back. Keep this with you each week. Bring it with you to be able to take notes. Also in this booklet are the discussion questions to our life groups. So our life groups will be walking through six weeks talking about what it means to be fully committed. Yes, period. And there's going to be teaching that I've recorded to kind of begin that and then discussion in the groups. If you're not in a life group, this is a great time for you to find one and join one. And even if you can't be a part of a life group, you can, you can tune in online. You can go to our website and you can watch the teaching and use the, the guide to facilitate discussion. And so we want you to know about that for life groups. And then the last thing, there's a little insert. This is our commitment card. And what we want you to do with this, we'll talk more about it in the weeks ahead, is just begin to look through that and pray about what does it look like for me to put God first and to, 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 to give him everything in my life to say yes, to give God my very best. So uh, keep that book with you. Write your name on the back because inevitably some of you will leave it even this morning on your chair. And so write your name on it, make sure you have that with you, bring that back with you uh, each week. So as we jump into this, as we look at this, this study on the life of Abraham and really what it means to say yes, period, I, I want to ask a couple of questions. One is a church and one is individuals. As a church, we want to ask the question, why has God blessed us and what does he desire for us to do with that blessing? And then as individuals... How has God blessed you, and how does he desire for you to use that blessing? Because God blesses all of us. God blesses our church. God blesses us as individuals. And so as we look at the life of Abraham, as we jump in and walk through his life, I want to give you a little background. You've probably heard of Abraham, but maybe you don't understand the significance of Abraham. Really, outside of Jesus, there's probably no figure in human history that's had more of an impact. Three different faith groups 
all point their, their roots back to Abraham. Over half the population of the earth points their faith roots back to Abraham. And one of the things I love about Abraham as we think about his story is that life didn't just happen to Abraham. That Abraham actually happened to life. Like he didn't just go with the the flow, but, but he stood against, many times, we're going to see this, stood against his family, stood against uh, society. He, he redefined the future and his future in, in saying yes to what God wanted to do through his life. He was a man that said yes. Now, it's interesting when you think about the significance of Abraham, that, that in the beginning, and when I talk about the beginning, he's actually pretty old about three quarters of the way through his life. In football terms, he's starting the fourth quarter. And he has nothing. He has no children. He's still basically following his dad around. And and literally, his name at that point was Abram, means father, and he didn't even have any kids. Right? How would you like to be named something and, and, and your meaning and you don't even have that? It, it, it would be like a, a, big, a big guy named Tiny or, or a fast guy named Slowpoke. Right? The, the irony in it. So as you, you look at this, this is Abram, father. God's going to change his name to Abraham. And he's not just father. Now it's going to be the father of many. It, it seems like things aren't making sense. Like life is maybe mocking him. But God had a plan. Just like God has a plan for each and every one of us this morning. That that, that God has destined your life to have eternal significance. That's why all of us are looking for meaning. Even people that, that don't know God, that aren't connected to Jesus Christ, they're searching and looking for meaning because God created in us a desire to be a part of something that is eternally significant. But, but Abraham had to walk that path towards significant. He's 75 years old, has no kids, still following his dad around. But God entered in. And God began to show him the plan that he had for him. And, and Abraham ha- had to walk towards this significant. He had to say, yes, period. And it's the same challenge that we have. We have to walk towards that path of significance. This morning, if you're here and feeling like your life isn't making a difference, maybe you're, you're longing for that, God created that desire in you to be a part of His mission and His plan to make it eternal significance. That's why we have these billionaires out there. Any billionaires here? Okay, just wanted to see. Uh, they have these billionaires out here wanting to go out in space. They're all wanting to buy, you know, rockets and go out in the space. Do you think they want to go to space because they really care about space? You think Jeff Bezos wants to go out in space because he's like really just interested? No, no, no. These guys are searching for significance. They have so much, they've accumulated so much that they're just longing for for meaning and significance and they can't find it on the earth. So I guess the next next thing is let's go to space. Maybe I'll find significance there. So so in Genesis chapter 12, it's where we're going to start this morning. We we begin the life of Abraham. So if you have your Bibles, first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 12 is where we're, be, uh, where we're going to be. But before we get to 12, let me just give you a little background of Abraham. Because really his, his story starts in chapter 11. Chapter 11 is about the Tower of Babel. You heard of that before? Right? Basically what you had is, is rebellion. The entire earth had given into idolatry, had turned away from God. They were so uh, consumed with themselves and so arrogant that they thought that they could be God, which is always the root of our sin, right? We think we can be God. And they decided to build a tower, literally, that could could reach to the heavens. It was like the ultimate declaration of independence that I don't need God. So the entire world has has turned to idolatry, but there's this one family that kind of is still following after God. And it's led by a man named Terah. And Terah is the father of Abram. And and God comes to Terah and says, hey, I want to get you away from this idolatry. I want to send you out, take your family. And so 
Terah leaves, he takes his son Abram, his last son that's living, who has no kids. So it's almost like this one family that kind of still follows God is about to end because the family tree is about to end. And chapter 11 seems like, like it's all about to be over. And then we pick up in chapter 12, verse 1, and it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your house and go from your country your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here this guy that's 75 years old really hasn't accomplished anything, really isn't doing anything doesn't even have kids. And God says, hey, listen, I have a promise for you. You're going to be a great nation. What do you think Abraham's response was to that? Like, God, are you talking to the right person? God, have you seen my wife, Sarah? She's cute, but she's old. We don't have any kids. I'm not going to be the father of squat, much less a nation. But what is God doing here? He's reaching out to to Abram who feels like he's nothing and has no hope and no significance and he's offering him a new beginning. I'm gonna make from you a great nation. Not just a nation, a a, a nation of people who follow after God, who who make me known to the ends of the earth. You, You think about this, this is what's cool about the Bible, how everything goes together. You and I, are part of that promise that we've inherited from Abraham because one of Abraham's descendants is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. So in Christ, God offered salvation to the whole world. In Christ, we're commissioned to bless the whole world by taking the news of Jesus Christ to all the families of the earth. Matter of fact, if you look in the book of Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament, you have the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of them have kind of a different target audience. Matthew is the most Jewish-centric that he's writing to to Jewish people to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah. So in the beginning of the book of Matthew, there's the lineage, there's the family tree of Jesus. Guess what, it goes all the way back to who? Abraham. So at the beginning, you see the promise of Abraham being fulfilled through Jesus at the end of the book of Matthew is the clearest example that we have of the Great Commission. Right, so in a way, the Great Commission is an extension of the promise of Abraham. And so Abraham's yes experience is a model for us to be able to say yes to what God wants to do. So as as we look at this this morning, I, I want us to ask three questions, just to begin to ponder, begin to pray about, begin to ask three questions. And here's the first one, why don't you write down your notes. The first one is, am I really following God? Am I really following God? Not are you really a pretty good person? Not are you really going to church sometimes? Not are you really moral? Are you really following God? And to to, to kind of rephrase that question, who's really in charge of your life? You or God? Do you make the calls? Do you set the agenda? Are you in charge or is God in charge? And you think about Abram, who later became Abraham. Abraham's sitting in Ur. He's not looking to leave. He's not one of those young people that's like, I can't wait to get out of this little town. His bags aren't packed. He's not dreaming of someplace else. He's perfectly fine where he is. But what? God said go. And when God says go, when God calls you to something, he has a choice to make. What's my response going to be? I heard a pastor one time say that when it comes to to God's calling, we put our yes on the table and then God puts it on the map. Think about that. We put our yes on the table. God, what do you want me to do? I don't know yet. I put my yes on the table. Then God says, okay, now that you've said yes, let me show you what I want. Let me show you what I want to do in your life. Let me show you what I'm calling you to. He, he, his command to Abraham is intentionally open-ended. He, he says, go to the land that I'll show you later. 
Don't you like when God does that? I sense he's calling me to this. I, I sense that he's speaking this word to me. But he's not giving me the details. We like to know the details. Like, tell me where you're calling me so that I can back up and weigh my options, God. Maybe I can make one of those little, you know, boxes where here's the pros and the cons. But we just put our yes on the table. Go to the land I will show you and I'll show you later. God said go and Abraham said where? God said I'll show you later. God said I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham said how? And God said I'll take care of it. Just, just follow after me. John Calvin Theologian summarized the call of Abraham this way. He said that God told Abraham to just close your eyes and take my hand. Just close your eyes and take my hand. Isn't that what we do many times as parents with our kids? Hey, just trust us. Just take my hand. As adults, where you're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, it's no different that God is saying, put your yes on the table, period. Just close your eyes and take my hand. That's what saying yes is all about. It takes all the excuses off the table. Well, what about this, God? Well, God, I don't know, I don't know if you've seen my, my bank account. I don't know if you've seen my, my schedule. I have a lot to do. It's difficult to be plugged in. It's difficult to serve. We have all these excuses. God, let me see what you want me to do and then let me evaluate that. Saying yes, putting it on the table, God, whatever you're calling me to, wherever you're calling me, my answer is yes. See, what I've found in my life, and I think this is pretty true of, of everybody, is we want the American dream. We, we want the great family and the nice house and the stuff, the great marriage and a little bit of God. He's like the icing on top. He just kind of completes everything. We, we, want, we want God to be in our life, but we want him in the passenger seat because I have the will. See, that's impossible. It, it's not a Carrie Underwood song where you just sometimes go, Jesus, take the wheel. It's I'm in his vehicle and he's driving and I'm in the passenger seat or maybe not even there. I might be in the back on the third row. But wherever he's leading is where I'm going. I'm saying yes. It's impossible to say yes to God and constantly take back the wheel. It's kind of like uh, uh, all the, the direction navigation apps that we have on our phone. There's like 50 of them now. You got, you got Apple Maps. You got Google Maps. You got Waze. You put in the address. And what do they do? They give you suggestions. Hey, I'm going to Dallas. Here's a suggestion. I'm going downtown. Here's, a, here's how you should go. How many of you don't trust those sometimes? Especially guys are like, yeah, I don't have to. They don't know what they're doing, right? Ways is like, turn right here. And you're like, yeah, I don't know about that. That doesn't seem to make sense. So you go your own way. And what happens is you, you don't pay attention to the suggestions. What, is, what does the app do? Recalculates, right? Oh, oh, you missed that. Okay, turn here. Oh, you missed that one too. No, 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 turn here, right? And it just keeps re, recalculating. But here's the deal, God doesn't come to give suggestions and then recalculate based on our response. God comes, when we give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, God comes, listen, for total surrender. He's not recalculating. He's not making suggestions. He's calling us to say yes, period. And we all want the, the what of his will when he says that we should worry about the who. Who is calling me? Oh, God is calling me? Yes. Are oh, you want me to go here? Yes. You want me to serve over here? Yes. That's what surrender looks like. Just close your eyes and take my hand. That's faith. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. Now, one more point before we move on from this. This calling of Abraham that, that God had given to him had to be responded to personally. God wasn't just giving this general calling out to everybody. He was going to Abraham specifically and saying, I want you to leave your home. And Abraham had to follow that personally. And if you follow the story and walk through the story, Terah, Abram's father, 
took his family and they, they left where they were, they left Ur, and, and they traveled to a place called Haran, which literally means delay. So they, they went kind of part of the way, and then God comes to, to Abraham and he says, I want you to go all the way with me. I want you to leave your father, I want you to leave your family, I want you to leave your stuff, and I want you to go to the place that I'm gonna show you later. Isn't that what normally happens to us? We're willing to go part of the way? God's calling you to this, and you're like, well, I can do this. There's a personal response. And God's saying, listen, I'm not, I'm not asking you to go part way, I'm asking you to go all the way with me, and that's, that's what yes means. I'm gonna go the whole way with God. At some point, individually, personally, all of us have to make our own decision to follow God. It's not your parents' decision. It's not your spouse's decision. Personally, we have to make our own decision to follow after God. It's it's the same way at a church like Mission City Church. God's at, at work in our church and he's blessing our church in amazing ways. It's not just enough Uh, to be in a church like ours, you have to be engaged in what God's doing. You don't just get brownie points for being a part of something, but being engaged in, in what's happening. God doesn't reward and bless us for just associating with the right group. We have to jump in and we have to say yes personally. God, you're calling me to this and my answer is yes. So the first question, am I really following God? And the second one, is where's my security? Where's my security? Is it my bank account? Is it in my title? Is it in my job? I love this as you think about uh, this story. God wasn't calling Abraham to make God part of his life, to make just a few little tweaks. Hey, you know, over here, just don't cuss quite as much. Just make a, a few little moral tweaks here and there. God was calling Abraham to to completely surrender to his plans, to say yes. The same way God's not just calling us to make a few little tweaks in our life, to to just, you know, know, morally, I'm going to make some adjustments and and be a, a little bit more of a moral person. No, God's asking for surrender for us to say yes. You, you think about Abraham's life again, the, the family connections, the land that he had, that was that was everything. When, when God said, leave those things and go to the place that I'm going to show you, it would be like today, God's saying, I want you to leave your career, I want you to leave uh, everything you own, and I want you to leave your income. I want you to leave everything and just go where I told you to go. Well, let's be honest. If you knew somebody here today and that was their testimony, they were like, hey, yeah, God told me to leave my job, leave my money, leave my family, leave everything. Well, where are y'all going? We don't know. God said he's going to tell us. You're like, cuckoo, 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 right? But that's surrender. That's exactly what happened. And that's a, that's a big ask. You think about your own life. If you, if you want to know, am I completely surrendered to God? Think about the areas you don't completely trust God. If God said, give this, that your answer would be no. That's one of the things that I'm I'm praying for us as a church and that I'm excited about is that that we as a church would say, yes, period, God, whatever you want to do, wherever you're leading us, however you're calling us, our answer is yes. That as individuals, God, whatever you're leading me to do, wherever you're leading me and calling me to serve, my answer is yes, period. None of this, "Mm, not this, God. My answer is yes. Some of us might say yes to serving. Some of us might say yes to to giving. Some of us might say yes to to working with kids, but we still hold on to to this one area of our life. See, God doesn't give us participation credit. He doesn't say, oh, you've you've given me 70%, okay, that's good. Other 30%, whatever. Now, God says, listen, Jesus gave 100% on the cross for you. In the same way, I'm calling you to give 100%. What does it say? That we die to self daily. We take up our cross and follow him. That's what yes means. That's 100% commitment, all in saying yes to him. Becoming a, a follower of Christ means viewing everything in your life as something to say yes with. All of the blessings, everything that I am. God's a, a rich giver. He's a good father. He, he loves us. He gives us good gifts. 
But he doesn't just bless us just to have blessings. All, all the things that we have, we don't just have so we can just accumulate more and so that we can just use these things for ourselves. He gives us these blessings to be able to offer back to him. Why? So that he can multiply those blessings for his kingdom's sake. So that he can use them for his glory. So the key question comes back to, why did God bless me? Why, why has God blessed me? That's a fundamental question. And as a Christ follower, God's going to be asking us that. Why have I given you these blessings to, to just be accumulated, to just use for yourself? Or, or to be used for his glory, to be able to bless others? So there's, there's two things. When you think about seeds, there's two things that you can do with seeds. You can either grind them up, which basically is you consume them, or you can plant them. You can consume them or you can plant it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10, 10 talks about this. He says, he, God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, which supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. In other words, God gives us blessings, seed to sow for the benefit of his kingdom, to see righteousness go forward. So, so it leads us to the third question. Have I offered my blessing back to God and said yes to his kingdom work? The, the things that God has blessed me with, whether it's my home, whether it's my cars, whether it's my resources, whether it's my time, have I used those things for his kingdom work? And it doesn't matter where you are, what season of life you're in, what you're going through, what your circumstances are, every single one of us has some seed to sow for the kingdom of God, something that we can offer to him. We, we know this because we remember the story of the widow's might in Luke chapter 21. Jesus is in the synagogue, and the way that they used to do it, and I think this would kind of be interesting to, you know, reinstitute today, they had like these big drums in the front, right? And everybody had, had coins that were worth different valuations, and they would have like their time of offering, and they would all like file down and drop their coins in the jars. Y'all want to start that this week? No. So they would drop the, the coins in the jars, and what would happen is the, the religious people, the Pharisees, wanted to make sure everybody heard how much money they gave, and so they would drop these, you know, all these coins in there, and it's clanging all around, and people, ooh, pay attention, look how much he gave. And Jesus is in there one day with his disciples, and they're talking, and Jesus says, whoa, 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 did y'all hear that? And like, no, we didn't hear anything. He goes, no, 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 did you hear that? See that lady right over there? She's going through a tough season. She's a widow. She has nothing. Literally the last that she has left, she just dropped in the offering. Her sacrifice is greater than all the wealthy people that gave all of that stuff out of their abundance because she gave everything. Her answer was yes period. So here's one of the things that, that I want us to all understand. God doesn't ever call you to give what you don't have. It's not some crazy like, I'm going to give a billion dollars. Yeah, I don't have a billion. Never going to have a billion. Accumulate my whole life. I'm never going to have that kind of money, those kind of resources. God never calls us to give what we don't have. But God does call us to give everything to God so that it can be multiplied for his kingdom, so, so they can be sowed in his field. God wants to use people like you to make a kingdom difference. In the last three years in our church, we've seen almost 600 baptisms. In the last three years that we know of, almost 900 salvations. That means when we get to heaven for all of eternity, there's going to be 900 plus people there because of people like you that were part of Mission City Church and the ministries of this church making an eternal difference and seeing lives transformed by the gospel. That's a lot of people rejoicing over God's grace. That should excite you that, that you get to be a, a part of something like that. Several thousand new people call Mission City Church home that 12 months ago, 18 months ago, weren't even a part of our church. And God using the ministries and the people of our church 
to see lives transformed, engaging people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with all of those blessings, the blessings that we have as a church, the blessings that we have individually comes responsibility. And I believe in the days ahead that God wants to increase our capacity to see more lives transformed. That's what this yes journey is. It's three critical discipleship questions that we wanna just pray through, and that's all we're asking you to do, to pray through these things. Have I fully surrendered to him? Is there any area of my life that I'm holding back? Now, now think about that. There's a, there's a financial component to what we're talking about. I'm not gonna beat around the bush about that. Like it's our people giving to the ministry that God's calling us to. But ultimately, can you imagine A church full of people that lived completely surrendered, that said, yes, period, God, whatever you want to do, wherever you're calling me to, whatever ministry you want to be a part of, however you're calling my family, maybe it's to go, whatever. My answer is yes, period. What do you think God could do with a church like that? What do you think the impact could be in our city? of a church like ours that just said yes, period. So have I fully surrendered to him? The second question again, what do I trust most? What do I put my trust in? What what are the things that I look at, my title, my, my position, my home, my stuff, my resources, what do I put my trust in? And then the last one, what kingdom am I living for? I think one of the, the reasons that I think our generations find death more difficult maybe than past generations is is we've created in our minds a heaven on earth, that that we, we think this is a pretty great place. And so in our minds, we know that there's heaven somewhere out there, but we want to kind of kick that can down the road for a while because we really like this. And and so to say yes, period, is changing our mentality from this is my home to this is just temporary and I'm living for the eternal. And it's amazing when, when, when when your priority changes from the temporal and the temporary to the eternal, that it impacts every area of your life. Because then I'm not worried, I'm not scared, I'm not anxious. God, whatever you're calling me to, wherever you're calling me to go, my answer is yes, period. So when you think about Mission City, when you think about individuals that make up our church, I I believe that we're about to go through a season that's going to change us as a church. And not not just physically, but, but change us spiritually as a church. That God's gonna increase and extend our impact and reach in our city and our world. That he's gonna change us individually to revolutionize this city, this area, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that God's gonna teach us, maybe in a way that he's never taught us before, dependence and trust in following him, that we just put our yes on the table, and then God directs us. That God's gonna use you to make an eternal difference. Now, you might hear that and go, okay, that's, that's pretty big talk sacrifice and surrender and faith and yes period and laying it all on the line. Like, I don't, I don't know that I'm going to be able to do that if I'm just honest with you. Well, let me encourage you today. Let me tell you why I believe you will be able to do this. Because if you think about the life of Abraham, ultimately, Abraham did what God asked him to do. Not perfectly. We're going to see that. A lot of ups and downs, a lot of hiccups and oopses along the way. But you know who fulfilled everything that God asked him to do perfectly? Jesus. In every way that Abraham failed, Jesus succeeded. Jesus answered the call. Jesus was asked to go out alone, to leave his father's house, to leave a place of security, to go to the unknown. He did so gladly, why? For you and me, because we desperately needed him. He became homeless. He became fatherless so that we could have a real home and a heavenly father. The reason why I believe that you can come to a place in your life and say yes, period, and trust God completely is because Jesus did. 
And the same spirit that worked in Jesus is the same spirit that we have in Christ today. To be able to live, to be able to say yes, to find our ultimate security in him. That we would understand that that God has promised through Christ to give us everything that we need. Where's our security? It's in him. Christ's sacrifice for you becomes our motivation to surrender to him. So my prayer is that as a church, we would all come to this place where we say, God, I'm ready to discover what saying yes, period, looks like for me. So as you pray, God, what does that look like in my life? What, what does it look like for me to, to, to put you first and give you my best? Understand, we're not going to ask you as a church to do anything that God is not calling you to do. So here's where I'd ask you to join me in just beginning to pray a prayer. And we're going to put this prayer up on the screen and we'll send it out this week. And I I just want you to join me in praying this and just see what God does in your life. Just pray, God, awaken us from our slumber. Attune us to the movement of your spirit. Empower us to be a people who truly say yes, period. God, we desire to surrender ourselves fully to you to show how you want us to give generously. As you've generously given to us, equip us, God, to see our lives and the lives of others transformed by the gospel. Help me, Father, to be able to say, and more importantly, live, yes, period. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And God, we thank you, Lord, that that everything you call us to, everything that we read in Scripture, God, you you fulfilled fully. God, that that Jesus stepped out of his comfort zone, that, that Jesus left his father, that Jesus sacrificed his life in obedience. He had a choice for us. And the same way that we look at the life of Abraham, we're going to see that there are are times that he stepped out in faith and he was really bold. And then a lot of times he messed up royally. But God, how you continually came back and called him. And Lord, you made a covenant with him that's been fulfilled to this day. And God, through Christ, you make a covenant with us that, that we can be forgiven through the blood of Jesus. That that we can become a new creation. That we can be a part of something greater and bigger than ourselves. That we can be a part of something eternal. God, I pray that in this next season, Lord, as we seek your face individually, that we would learn and God, that we would come to a place where we could say yes, period. Complete surrender to you. And God, I'm excited about what that's going to look like. What what a church that says yes, period, would look like in the days ahead. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our online worship service. God is doing so many things at Mission City Church that we would love for you to be a part of. Just go to missioncity.church to learn more. I also want to encourage you to worship today through giving. Click the Give button at the top of your screen and you can be a part of our mission in that way as we continue to see God transform lives here in San Antonio and online. We'll see you next week.